Hi everyone, so here's a new video series, a new fresh start, since uh, nowadays I uh, play less, so I have more time to stream and to record some hopefully useful videos for those of you who uh, want to uh, play chess better, to understand chess better, and in this particular series I'm gonna talk uh, about endgames, we're gonna analyze some useful end games as i can see it and hopefully uh, you will learn something new and you will uh, be able to apply this knowledge uh, this positions uh, this tricks into your games if you want to see more videos like this don't forget to press like or leave a comment uh, about this um, series or about something else that you would like to see or you would like me to record and we'll go from there um, i will try to uh, work more regularly on my youtube channel and post more videos so see you soon and let's play chess one i played a game i played a game uh yesterday uh, thank you so much for supporting Ezra's monkey i played a game let me see let me try to add it Doo -doo 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 -doo. i played a game it was a very interesting game it was a 10 minutes game but unfortunately it was 10 minutes uh, with um, 10 minutes with no increment but nevertheless nevertheless there was a very interesting end game that happened mm -hmm. how do i edit it i add it like this i think yep okay i was playing black i was playing well uh and i was well i ended up in an end game with uh, a pawn down but it should be holdable <laughs> again if you're not playing on seconds and as you can see uh, we didn't have a lot of time and uh, yeah we reached this end game which actually is a theoretically drawn end game even without this pawn although since my king is so close to the edge of the board I should be careful because without this pawn against h and f pawns if the king of the defending side is uh, pushed to the back um, rank the positions usually are lost and but I have uh, a pawn on h7 it changes a little bit the situation uh, although here I made a mistake I made a mistake I think rook rook c6 is a losing move let me check and let let let's discuss this endgame in more details because I think that's quite an important endgame and I know that endgames are not as entertaining as attacks or uh, opening lines but i do believe that they are very useful to to study and here are only four moves there are only four moves that uh, holds the position for black and rook c6 is not one of them rook c6 is not one of them apparently apparently there is a very uh, unpleasant uh yes that's what i played rook c6 uh, losing yeah apparently rook b8 and rook h8 is threatening so black needs to prepare for this move ah that's what i want to actually i need to back up a little bit because the easiest way to make a draw here for uh black would be to play h6 and then after king takes h6 i play king f6 and if i win this pawn the position is drawn 
and there is no really way to uh, improve the position for white here even though they have two extra pawns but as we know h and f pawns are usually mm, those endgames are quite often drawn endgames so here basically almost any move gives a draw i can just simply wait and if white goes to h7 if they try to somehow improve the position i can just keep checking so this move doesn't really help and otherwise i just wait uh, i don't really need to lock the king i better keep the rook uh far away in order to be able to check the king all the time although rook g4 here also gives a draw um, but of course h6 you need time to calculate and you see that i only had 44 seconds and it's uh it's a game with no increment and that's actually what spoils it because i like this tournament so much actually uh, now the knockout right started i like this tournament so much it's like a very good training and i enjoy playing against uh, very strong opponents but at the same time it spoils this end games just tremendously because you play a high level game and then and then it's just about who is faster and here you, you you're gonna see i made a huge blunder but just because i saw that uh, i'm running out of time and i didn't have i mean i didn't have time mm, to uh, think and okay so i played rook d6 it's okay but at the same time it's kind of forces my king to the back rank it's not losing here and yeah indeed rook d8 uh, saved the game here uh, there are some positions it's quite rare that you can save the game by placing your pieces so badly <laughs> just playing um, very passively but in fact yeah it's possible here just to stay on the eighth rank and apparently apparently let's see how i hold let's see how i hold so let's pretend white plays uh king to f6 i wait king to e7 it's hard to believe of course you either need to know that it's a draw or you need time to um, make sure it's a draw because for, for me it's hard to believe uh, okay so let's wait so i wait maybe stalemate let's see so i wait f6 uh, f6 okay i wait yeah hmm very interesting so it might be it might be a fortress we just discovered a fortress so i just wait and if the pawn goes forward it's a draw and if it's not promoted then i mean i just simply wait wow uh hard to believe right mm, and if for example white tries to exchange the rooks it doesn't help because if they exchange the rooks then my king gets to f7 and actually if let's let's put the king to uh h8 and no this one is lost so after king h8 rook d7 i need to keep the king here because if i play king h8 rook d7 and make like a waiting move then this position is already lost yeah take take yeah and they make a waiting move and play f7 f8 so but of course i mean it's very hard to yeah i think you either need to know that it's a draw uh, like by heart that this some kind of a fortress or usually in end games it's very important to keep your rook active quite active and let's see how the draw is made in the case yeah it's possible here to play rook d1 
And apparently, even though white wins this pawn, it doesn't help them. The position is drawn, or I can keep checking the king. Yeah, probably that's the easiest way. I keep, I can keep giving checks. But instead, since it was played on seconds, I decided to play rook c6, and this position is lost already, because white gives a check. No, they had to give a check here, and play rook h8. And here it's another story, because when white wins the pawn, they at the same time, they forces the king to go to the back rank. And this position is already winning for white. We're gonna discuss it in more details when it's gonna happen on the board. In the game, my opponent played rook g7, I played king h8, rook g7, and as far as we know, rook c8 would still give me, I mean, would still keep the position drawn. But I played king g8, and again, rook d8, rook h8 seems to be winning, and that's how my opponent played. He won the pawn, and he forced my uh, king to go to the 8th rank. And this position is a winning position, and actually I have the whole like bunch of uh, theoretical positions in my database. Um, we can compare this one with uh, the one we just saw. If white pushes uh, their pawns to h6 and f6, it's been proven that the position is almost always winning. And the plan, the winning plan, is to get with the king to e8 to cover it from checks and then just to promote the pawn. So let's see how it's done. Uh, king goes, king goes, king goes to e8. Yeah, there is a move h7, king h8. King e7, very beautiful move. If the king takes and there is a check, king g6, f7, and the pawn gets promoted because there is a check from the rook. Uh, what is difficult in these positions, with um, even in winning positions uh, with h and f pawns, that those positions often in order to win you need to sacrifice one of the pawns and it's always tricky right you're always scared to sacrifice it because you need to sacrifice it in the right position for example here you sacrifice it but the key is why it's winning because your king gets to the eighth rank and then it plays f7 uh, so that is the plan to win and again, we see that after king takes h7, a very important thing is that the rook, the white's rook is on the 8th rank, and at the same time this pawn is not attacked, so white king has time to go to f8, and black doesn't have time to attack it, because white gives a check. And after king h7, they play rook f6, beautiful move, and then king e8, for example rook b7, king e8, rook b8, king uh, e7, and if king g7, f8, queen, if rook b7, king e6, and little by little the king runs away, but it's hard, right? It's tricky, and this is good to know, it's good to know those uh, ideas of f and h um, positions rook a2 some similar similar positions when the king goes to e8 and then white the stronger side sacrifices uh, the h pawn and gets the winning position with the f pawn but white needs to make sure that this position is winning because if it's black to move as we know, rook a8. Yes, thank you. Uh, if it's black to move, rook a8 saves the game. So it's like the position, like the most important position of all uh, the H and F uh, end games, because it's whose turn it is to move. It's if it's black to move, it 
give, I mean, it's a draw by rook f8, rook a8, rook e8, rook a7, uh, rook e7, and back to a8, rook d7, rook b8. And if it's white to move, white wins by playing king f8. And then, yeah, and then white is winning like this. King k8 is a threat. А почему король после взятия пешки вернулся на седьмую линию, а не приблизился ко второй белой пешке? Когда? When? Exactly. At what point? После взятия. Uh, here we analyzed. Let's get... King h6, rook e6. Ah, you mean here, king g5. But unfortunately, king g5, uh, well, first of all, I can play rook g6. Beautiful move. Because it's losing. And at the same time, f6. We know that if you want to fight in any endgames, actually, in almost any endgames, if you want to fight against a passed pawn, your king should try to get in front, right? If it doesn't have time to get in front, then it should be at least somewhere close to the spawn. It's it's usually it's a bad idea to um, be uh, behind. It's never good from behind um, because here, I mean, from the side, right? When the king is on the side, at least it supports these squares, and the rook should attack from this side. When the king is here, then white has all the squares they want to improve the position. So try to get in front, not behind the past pawn with the king. So yeah, so it is quite tricky and quite complicated. Uh, rook d8, king h7, rook f7, another example where white wins. Uh, and then I suppose rook a6, rook a8, winning. I mean, I'm not sure at exactly what moment you're talking about. It's uh, all very, we need to look precisely at each position. But just, I don't remember all those details and nuances, but what I do remember that if you're playing against f and h pawns and your king is um, pushed to the back uh, of the board, usually those positions are lost. So if you're trying to protect, uh, to defend those kind of positions, you should uh, have, you should try to have a possibility to go forward with your king when it's on g7, after a check, to have a possibility to go to f6 or h6. And usually you go to the pawn, to the side of the pawn that's more advanced. So for example, if the pawns like are on h5 and f4, after a check, you go to h6. Um, and here, yeah, another example of how white can win. And you see, they always, what that's what I'm saying, in order to win here, uh, the stronger side needs to sacrifice uh, the h pawn, but at the right moment, because after you sacrifice the pawn, there are positions that are lost. And but here the difference is that the king is on h8, and it doesn't give a black a possibility to play rook a8, and the eighth rank is very important, as we said. After king h7, king f8 check follows and f7. So if a white manages to advance this pawn and with the king in front of it, it's uh, and this pawn is not being lost in the next few moves, it's a winning position for white. King f8, king g6, and that's another way to win, a trickier way to win. And yeah, so we know h7 is a threat. And white is winning. Okay. Okay. And if we get back to my game, so I ended up in this lost position. But as we already discussed, 
The winning plan is often connected with the king getting to e8, covering the king from checks and pushing the pawn, the f pawn. But of course, it's impossible, I think, to memorize all the, well, I mean, for most of the people, it's just impossible to memorize all the endgame positions. But what's possible is to memorize uh, main ideas and to try to memorize or to understand at least the concept of like very basic endgames like uh, rook and pawn versus rook. Uh, well, and of, of course, the endgames that uh, can be often seen in practice because it's, it's a little bit useless to try to memorize you know, like some rarely uh, seen in practice endgames. But those endgames, they can uh, happen, they happen quite often. And it's good to know, uh, even if you know the evaluation, sometimes it helps. It gives you enough confidence uh, that um, this position can be uh, won and you're pushing and you're playing for a win. Mm, of course, it's even better if you know a winning plan or main winning ideas, uh, like here, for example. I don't know the concrete moves, but what I know is that these positions are lost when the king is pushed to the edge of the board, and the winning plan is often connected with my with the king of the stronger side getting to e8, and thus supporting the advance of the f pawn. And I think that's enough. I mean, I hope that it's enough, because if you play in an over-the-board game, usually you have time to calculate some uh, lines. But, of course, if we're talking about this this concrete game, it was, you see, that it was, my opponent had 14 seconds, I had 24 seconds with no increment, so it's not really about theory anymore, it's about who uh, plays uh, faster. And here he had to play king f7 and then just push his pawn to f6. Instead, he, uh, he for some reason, he gave up the h pawn, but he just started playing faster. And that what uh, gave him um, uh, a win after all. I mean, his idea was that uh, if I am, if I am going to take, if I'm taking it's a lost pawn endgame, of course, right? We know that. If I take here, it's also lost. Actually, I just recorded an endgame course for chess.com. It's going to be uh, presented soon, to be prepared soon. And we know that in the pawn endgames, king and the pawn versus king, if the pawn is on the fifth rank, uh, those squares are the key squares. If white king, if the king of the stronger side gets to one of those key squares before the pawn needs to be uh, moved up, it's a winning position. So king f6 here just wins, but it's easy to see. Uh, that's why I didn't take the pawn. That was the correct decision. And at the same time, h7 is the wrong move. That He made the wrong move because after f6, I have the so-called crazy rook on the board. So I keep, I keep checking his uh, king and it's a very well-known uh, stalemate. Uh, um, idea. A rook a8, so that's why he played rook a8, but this position is already a theoretically drawn position. I don't have time to get the famous Philidor position with the rook o on the 6th rank, and uh, it's the best uh, situation, I think, for the rook to, to be on the 6th rank, and when this pawn uh, moves up, the rook gets to the first rank and then keeps checking the king. That's the easiest plan. But at the same time, this position is also a drawn position and we discussed it briefly. We discussed it briefly that, well, my rook is ideally placed on the long side, uh, my king is on the um, short side. The only thing that I need to uh, keep in mind, I don't, I, I should um, make sure that white doesn't uh, get the 8th rank and have time to get with uh, his king to f8 and push his king to f7. So that's the only thing that I need to care about. If he plays king f7 here, he can give a check and then either play king h6 or I'll play rook b6. If 
he gives a check, I get to his pawn. So the pawn should be uh, moved closer if he wants to try to win, but it's not clear how to do that in this particular situation. Rook a6, rook b7 I played, rook e6, yeah, that's how actually he can try to push the pawn closer. And here, yeah, I was, I was just running, I got too nervous because I saw that uh, I had nine seconds on my clock and I panicked. Uh, in fact, I just had to go away with my rook. And if he gives a check, I play king g8. And if he gives a check, I play back. And here I give a check. And actually we get the same position that we discussed. And uh, that's why this position is very, very um, important. It's important to know how to hold these positions. Because actually there are only two moves that gives a draw here. Because if you play rook b1, the position is lost. Because there is a check. And unfortunately, there is one more check. And somehow, somehow the pawn just advances and white wins. So in order to hold the draw here, I need to play rook b6 or rook b8. And you better know this moves <laughs> because otherwise it's quite hard to, to make them. Rook b8, f6, and you just wait, I believe, here, rook 8. So the 8th rank is very, very important. Uh, rook b8, yeah, rook b8 or rook b6. Rook b6 is also enough to make a draw. Because if king f8, then you have this king h8. Also, it does look scary, right? But it's enough. Uh, I think, yeah, it's easier to play rook b8. If rook d7, then rook a8, I believe, can be played. And you just wait. You just wait. And, I mean, again, it can be scary. Yeah, king e7, it can be scary, I know. But it just white is not really threatening anything. So let me check how many moves uh, saves black here. Rook, uh, rook b8, king g6, king g8, even king h6, they all give a draw. Yeah, so it's better. That's why it's important just to know those. I'm not saying about um, super duper complicated end games so with two or more pawns, but end games with one pawn that happened quite often. It's just better to know. Yeah, it's terrifying. I know. But at the same time, you can play king g6. I mean, you better. Uh, if f7, then king g7. And you see that there is no way to for y to improve the situation. Uh, and if, for example, rook c7. Can I play rook a8? Yeah, I can play rook a8. Or if rook a7, can I play rook c8 or it's already? And I've seen many, many uh, actually positions and games where the defending side lost. Yeah. So just don't be scared. You, you better know that this is a draw. But it's very important. The control of the 8th rank sometimes is crucial because again if we uh, look at this position and if for example we play rook b5 and this is already yeah it's a bad example for example if we play yeah when the, the rook is on e7 you always need to be careful about this king f8 and then f6 so you better play rook b8 but there is a very famous endgame, let me find it, that was played at 
tragic comedy between uh, Vera Menchik and uh, Capablanca, Jose Raul Capablanca. Let me just find it. And those players, they were making mistakes every single move in Hastings uh, 20, in 1929. No, 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 the pawn on f6 is not uh, a win. That's what I, I want to show. Actually, usually it's, uh, it's not usually, it's about with the pawn on f6, it depends um, whether the defending side has time to protect the eighth rank or to attack the uh, this pawn. Mm. When the rook is on e7. So when the rook gets to e7, the stronger side rook gets to e7. King f8, check. Might be a threat. So you might... Uh, I mean, you should get ready to face this king f8. If it's white to move, king f8 wins. If it's black to move, rook b8, I think, is the easiest way to proceed here. When the rook is on e7, you just go to b8 and you protect the, um, the, f, I mean, the 8th rank. And if the rook goes to e8, then you can give a check and play king g6. So as long as you attack this pawn, as long as you don't let it uh, move forward, it's a draw. You can hold it. But in this game, in this famous comedy of errors, uh, Vera Menchik, the first women's world chess champion, played rook a6. So she decided to keep the rook on the 6th rank. And that is a huge mistake. Because after rook a6, she loses. In fact, rook b8 I think is the easiest. But rook b1 uh, is still a draw. Is still a draw. And let's analyze why. Because it's very important. Because sometimes this uh, move is a losing one. And sometimes, yeah. And this is a draw because after king f8 check, king g8, f7, there is king f6 and there is no king g8 because of rook g1. Yeah, still a draw, I know. And the rook cannot really go away because of rook b8. Uh, so rook b8 or rook b1 or rook b2 or rook b3, I believe uh, they all give a draw, rook b4 as well. <laughs> um, but in, in, instead, Vera Menchik played rook a6 and Capablanca could have won the game by playing king f8, uh, king g6, f7, king f6. And here is the problem that king g8 wins the game because there is no check on the g file. There is no way to protect from f8 queen. Ich, too bad. But instead he played rook d7 and she played rook a8 and he played rook e7 and she should have just waited rook b8. Now as we know rook a1, rook a2, rook a3, rook a4 or even king h6 they all keep uh, a draw but but she decided to <laughs> she decided to repeat the moves and played rook a6. And this time, Jose Raul Capablanca used his chance. He played king f8 check, he played f7, and as we know, king f6 loses to king g8 because there is no check, no saving check on the g file. And after rook a8, rook e8, rook a7, rook e6, king h7, I wanted to say Capablanca won the game, but in fact, he made he a made, uh, a huge mistake. He made a huge mistake. He played king e8. And king e8. King e8. Gives black a chance to make a draw again. Instead. 
of king e8, rook e1 should have been played. And after king g6, king g8, and rook f7 loses due to rook g1, and then rook f1 winning the rook. And if rook a8, then king e7, king f6, very beautifully, outflanking our own pawn and covering with the rook and winning the game. So that's how this position should um, be won. So if you get this position, you play rook e1, and then you play king e8, king e7, king f6. Don't start this maneuver with the rook on e6, because you will need, in order to win, you need to have this check from the g file, because after king e8, it gives a draw, because after rook a check, king e7, king, king g7, there is no check on the g file. And this is a draw, because rook a7 will follow. Instead, Vera Menchik played rook a7, and this one loses because of king f6. And if rook a8, rook e8, and the pawn promotes. So many mistakes, many, many mistakes, and it's very high level chess, right? It's a, it's a world champion, the third world champion, Hacera Ulka Pablanka, the famous, uh, he's famous for his uh, endgame technique, but actually knowing um, basic endgame positions is not about technique often, it's about knowledge. Yeah, black can give a check. But the king just gets closer to the rook and the checks are over and this pawn is getting promoted. There is no way to stop it. I mean, you can stop it, but you will need to sacrifice a rook. Those checks, black runs out of checks. Yep, too bad, I know. So you see how difficult and challenging uh, those uh, uh, end games are. They are quite, quite tricky and it good, it's very good to revisit. Oh, Grandmaster Hikaru! Wow, what a, what a nice surprise! Congratulations uh, on reaching the final and getting in the candidates. But we're here discussing end games, you know, boring stuff. And we just uh, had a look at the very famous uh, comedy of errors between two world champions, Hasera Ulka Pablanka, the uh, third world champion, the famous uh, Jose Raul Capablanca and the first women's world chess champion Vera Menchik. Um, I just showed an example of uh, my game against Alexander Bortnik yesterday that actually had the same position. You can compare. Could have had the same position if I if I wouldn't spoil at everything on nine seconds playing Rook G7. Okay, Rook G7 was just. Uh, the nervous pressure, let's put it this way. Actually, I could have played king h8. That was the last trick to play, but this position is lost anyway. And I was discussing how important it is to know the basics, the basics of end games. And that's like the most famous position of this kind in end games, rook and pawn versus rook. And it's black to move and make a draw. And we discussed, uh, well, in quite, a, in quite a detail here, what to do. And I'm sure you can I'm sure you will be able to find this game and See how to make a draw yourself. Okay, I will quickly go over again. So controlling the eighth um, rank is very important here when the uh, rook is already on e7. Although rook b1, rook b2, rook b3, rook b4, they all give a draw here. 
But in the game, Vera Menchik uh, blundered with rook a6, and in fact, this move loses because of king f8, king g6, f7, and surprisingly, the pawn promotes. Yes, indeed, rook b8 looks very logical, and it's very good that it looks logical for you. That means that you might make this move if this position happens in your game. But it didn't look logical for Vera Menchik, and even King of 8 didn't look log logical for Hussar Ul Capablanca. He played Rook D7. Vera Menchik played Rook A8, Rook E7, and unfortunately, <laughs> she, she got back to the sixth rank. Chess com is down. Why is it down? I was about to. I was about to play. Why every time I want to play? <laughs> Chess.com is down. Yep, it's down. So we, we better stay and study more end games, right? Well, it should it should get back. Let's hope it's gonna get back. Uh, for the moment, uh, we can discuss this end game in more details because we have we didn't have enough. You can't log in. I can't. Well, it happens. But I'm. We're in the classroom, and chess.com classrooms work fine. Yeah, and we discussed that even though this position is a drone position, it is quite scary because, for example, if white plays rook d7 and we wait, then king e7 follows. And it is so scary that this pawn is about, it seems that this pawn is about to get promoted. But in fact, we can just wait. And if f7 happens, king g7, and we control the f8 square. And if rook d8, well, it can be taken, and then the pawn will be taken. And, and there is no way for black, for white, to improve the position anyhow. Yeah, every time we want to play, the server gets down. It doesn't want us to play. It doesn't want us playing. But what is with rapid, uh, rapid chess championship? It's not down. Good. Well, we'll get back. So Vera Menchik made a blunder again. And Capablanca, he played king f8 and he played f7. And the position is winning for white. Hooray, hooray, king g8 and f8 queen is threatening. But so, for example, king f6, king g8. And that's what makes difference with the rook on a6. With the rook on a1, it still would be a draw. And Vera Menchik played rook a8, rook e8, rook a7, rook e6, king h7. And here, in order to win, white needs to get to e2 and then get with the king to f6 and cover the 8th rank with the rook and promote the pawn. That is the winning plan. So, rook e1, for example. If king g6, king g8 wins, then rook f1, rook takes f7. If rook a8, king e7, and king f6, and thus covering the rook the king and then the eighth rank and getting with the king step by step closer to the rook and promoting the pawn yep uh, but surprise surprise capablanca the famous a magician from cuba he made a mistake he played king e8 you see those they seem to be easy those end games but even strongest grandmasters they make such huge blunders every single um time they play well maybe not every single time but pretty often and king e8 gives a draw to black black just had to play king g7 and again this position with the pawn on f7 and does look scary but because of this threat rook a7 well capablanca was uh very good in playing technical end games, but technical end games is not mm. what <laughs> Александр, спасибо большое. Мы только только обсуждали партию вчерашнюю, вот эту позицию, а сейчас обсуждаем позицию из партии Капабланка Менчик. Так что, no, just I, uh, Alexander Bortnik just gave me a rate, and uh, I was saying that we all started with uh, uh, my um, game. I mean, I gave an example from my game against Alexander yesterday that I lost and actually it was well, winning and uh, drawing and the evaluation of the position was changing every move we made. 
but we are not the first ones to uh, make blunders in such positions. So this famous Capablanca Menchik example um, had seen many blunders as well. Thank you for the rate. Uh, I don't know what's going on today, but I've gotten so many rates that uh, thank you so much. So yeah, King G7 gives a draw and instead Vera Menchik played Rook A7 and it's a lost. It's a lost position after that. So instead of saving the game against the famous third world champion, by the way, 1929, he just became the uh, the world champion, no? He won Jose Raul against uh, Lasker. When when did he win Lasker? Capablanca at what? Uh, And 21. Well, not <laughs> not um, eight years ago. Eight years ago. Not. Uh, I, I thought for some reason that it was in um, 1927. Okay, that's it. The sun games. I think it's enough. Don't you think so? It's always good to alternate. I mean. Uh, in order not to get bored with those end games, uh, we need to somehow change the topic. And 